Orthodox Church in America. My name is Father Anthony Cook. I serve in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. And I'm Father Andrew Stephen Damick, Chief Content Officer of Ancient Faith Ministries and a priest of the Antiochian Archdiocese. And we're the Orthodox Intro Team. If you're looking for a first stop online to get an introduction to the Orthodox faith, a place to get answers to questions from qualified Orthodox Christian clergy, a place to send your friends and not just toss them into the chaos of the internet, a place to get help finding an Orthodox parish and get plugged into an actual Orthodox community, then point your web browser at orthodoxintro.org. Orthodoxintro.org is a free service of Ancient Faith Ministries and made possible by our donors. It's an Orthodox on-ramp to the Christian life. Again, that's Orthodoxintro.org. Proclaiming Christ, victor over sin and death. You're listening to Ancient Faith Radio, your Orthodox Internet radio connection. This is Ancient Faith Today with Father Tom Soroka, a weekly live call-in show addressing the issues of our day from a distinctly orthodox perspective. You can join the conversation by calling in at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Father Tom is the priest at St. Nicholas Orthodox Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and welcomes guests from across the globe to discuss important topics of interest. Here's Father Tom. Welcome to Ancient Faith Today. This is Father Tom Soroka, and I'm so glad that you're with us this evening. We'll be taking your calls in a bit at 1-855-AF-RADIO. That's 1-855-237-2346. Matushka Trudy will be answering your calls tonight, so please make sure to turn the show volume off before you come on air. To participate online, we encourage you to go to the AFM Facebook page at facebook.com slash ancientfaithministries and place a question in the thread for tonight's show where it is being live simulcast. You can also send us an email at aft at ancientfaith.com. And if you'd like to send us a question or comment immediately right from your phone, send us a text message to 412 206 5012. Write it down. 412 206 5012. We actually have questions that have already been sent in to our text line, and it's a wonderful way to reach us very quickly. But we would love to hear your voice. Give us a call at 1 855 AF Radio. Let's get started. There are as many reactions to the sacrament of confession as there are Orthodox Christians, so it seems. Most priests will confirm that some Orthodox Christians really struggle with confession. Either they don't know what to say, or, unfortunately, they might be indifferent about it, or they're simply fulfilling an obligation, or maybe they're unwilling or uncomfortable about opening up and saying the truth about their deepest spiritual and moral struggles. Others, however, frequently partake of the sacrament of confession, talking about their struggles and difficulties and frustrations, though they also may often bemoan their ability to make a truly heartfelt confession. However, most people are somewhere in between. They want to make a good and sincere confession, but Possibly they feel uncomfortable, or they have failed to prepare property properly, so they end up talking about a few common human sins like getting angry, or being impatient, or holding grudges. So let's be honest today. Confession is not easy. It doesn't come naturally to us, and we forget sometimes that the main point of confession isn't simply to recite a long list of sins, which we hope somehow will get us out of the sacrament uh, unscathed by the priest, but rather 
The whole point is to assess our life in relationship to God, to other people, and even to ourselves, and to ask for the grace of God to heal us and draw us closer to him. So, our topic tonight is the sacrament of confession and healing our heart. It's going to be helpful to those who first are inquiring about orthodoxy and maybe confession is one of those sticking points that's maybe keeping them from fully entering the faith because they don't really know about it and they're uncomfortable with the whole idea of it. It's also going to be most helpful to Orthodox Christians and all Christians who have the sacrament of confession who sincerely desire to avail themselves of the sacrament to make a better confession, to grow closer to God, and ultimately to become like him. So, Tonight, we're happy to have back Father Paul Janakis. He's a very good friend of this program and an outstanding Orthodox priest. Father Paul is the rector of St. Luke Orthodox Church in Palos Hills, Illinois. He's also the chancellor of the Diocese of the Midwest in the Orthodox Church in America. He's a graduate of Concordia College and St. Vladimir Seminary. He holds dual master's degrees from in community and addictions counseling. He's also a licensed professional professional counselor for the Ethos Counseling Group. Father Paul, welcome back to Ancient Faith Today. Father Thomas, it's wonderful to be back with you again. We're glad you're here. This is such a great topic. In fact, another text just popped in. So this is really an important topic. Um, I think... I, I, I think I got it right in saying that people want to make a, a good confession, but it's uncomfortable. It, it, there's something about it that makes it very difficult. And so I'm and hoping do, that, yeah. Uh, yeah, the hour with you tonight, I think is going to be very well spent because we're going to help a lot of people to make a better confession and obviously grow closer to God and receive that grace that's in the sacrament. So, uh, for those who are uninitiated, uh, Father Paul, tell us what confession is. What is the sacrament of holy confession? Very good, Father Thomas. So, uh, in a word, this great gift of the sacrament of holy confession, of the mystery of holy penance, we might even call it, or holy repentance that belongs to this, this kind of um, uh, experience, This is the means by where Christians, Orthodox Christians, come before the priest after a time of fasting and prayer and confess vocally all of the sins that they may have committed for the preceding period since their last confession. And this is done, as you said so very well in framing up uh, with your introduction, Father Thomas, it's not done just as an obligation, and we don't want it to be something done by rote, um, you know, which is always a danger for those of us who have been in the church for a long time. But we do this in order to live our baptismal life. And this is why I like to teach, at least in my parish, that there is a very dynamic connection between baptism and confession. Many people think Mm. that confession is somehow related to communion, which of course it is, especially in the Slavic traditions, but there's still that kind of, that kind of vital link. But in in a, in a more, um, in a more deeper way, even in, in, in more proper theology, in the experience of our church, you know, baptism is, is related to, uh, uh, confession is related to the baptismal life because The whole of our Christian life is baptismal in the sense that we die to self and live to Christ, which is the pattern of baptism. And it's not a baptism uh, that is a one-time event that may have happened to us when we were a little child or a young baby and that we don't even remember it, but it's a pattern and it's a mystery whereby we come to life in Christ by dying to our sins, by being cleansed of those sins so that we can be healed and so that Christ can come to life in us. And so 
I always begin with that kind of uh, caveat about the importance of <laughs> knowing what the Christian life is, being baptismal in scope and experience, and then how confession itself is a very practical way of continuing in that pattern, that mystery by where we die to self, where by whereby we die to our sins so that um, our true selves, uh, Christ, the living Christ, uh, can, can be raised within us, can be born within our hearts. So, so Father Paul, that's, that's a wonderful introduction, and I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm going yeah. to poke around a little bit here because, you know, yeah, we have many people— <laughs> well, we have many people that are not Orthodox that are listening to the program right now, and they're saying, well, wait a second, you know, I can confess to God, I don't need you to sit yeah. there and, and listen to my sins, um, I I confess to God every night before I go to bed, and, and when I say my prayers, so why do I, you know, why do I need this idea of a, of a priest listening to my confession? And, and as a confession being a sacrament of the church, right? So here's what we would say. You and I both remember, um, we remember being taught by Father Tom Hopko, and I always remember what Father Thomas said. And he said that it's important for us to confess our sins daily. And that's part of our prayer rule, even if you go back to many of our prayer books, you know, in, the, in those evening prayers, there, there is a little space there for, for the, you know, kind of private, you know, thoughtful um, confession of whatever daily sins that we have. But we have this formal uh, confession because it has to be vocalized and, and we have to be accountable to someone else besides ourselves. And, and first of all, because I'm going to say it's scriptural. You know, we often hear our, our, um, our Protestant friends or our evangelical friends speaking about the primacy you know, uh, of the Holy mm -hmm. Scripture. And, and mm -hmm. if we go back to the actual Greek, you know, we find a couple of interesting passages. First of all, this, this well-known passage at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, it's there, I think, in Mark as well, you know, at Matthew chapter 3, where all of the faithful in Judea are going to the Jordan River in order not only to be baptized by uh, John, the forerunner, but it literally says, and to confess their sin, and they're confessing mm. to him. And the, the Greek word there is very interesting, exomologumeni, meaning that they're continually confessing. And thus we have in the Greek the word exomologisis, which is the word for confession, which means the vocalizing of one's sins and transgressions. And I did a little study today. I, I um, I texted one of my other Serbian priest friends to ask for the Slavic or the Slavonic, you know, equivalent, which is ispovjed, ispovjed. And that ispovjed, is a word which yeah. means bringing something on the inside to the outside. You know, so clearly we, we have this kind of physical, vocal expression of our sins, and we need to do it. And then, of course, in the, fam the famous passage in in the, you know, the epistle of St. James, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. Again, uh, right. another use of that word, uh, exomologisis. Um, but the other part of it is just cleansing, that we really need to be cleansed of our sins and, and, and passions. And we cannot do that unless we are able to find that person we trust, usually, hopefully, our, our parish priest, and we are able to open up and and really make a a, a complete and even a brutal you know um, cleansing of all those things that that we have in our lives that are inside of us that that are part of our behaviors whereby you know we have um, sinned against the the God who really loves us. So there are there are these two things that it cleanses us in the sense that. You know, it heals us, and then it also fosters the, the need for accountability. You know, I confessed to one priest in Detroit for 28 years. I lived in Michigan, and, and we mm. had this very good relationship. And since I moved to Chicago, I have somebody else here 
I cannot do right. that anymore, which I kind of miss. But I have this one elderly priest that is is a wonderful man, um, and and I see him uh, almost every weekend, and and um, I trust wow. him implicitly, and I'm able to make that kind of confession and to do it on in, in this ongoing way. Uh, but that's, that's great. what we would say about. And you know what's interesting, Father Thomas? Let me add one thing. Even sure. in the secular world, speaking again as a psychotherapist, we would <laughs> right, say that right. nobody, yeah. nobody, um, uh, nobody comes to them comes to to their true self, or they're they're not able yeah, to heal right. even even in therapy right. unless they talk. You know, they have to talk their problems out. The way that sure. they put into words what their problems are, what their hurts are. You know, right. the way that they put into words is the way that they come to understand, you know, w- w- what these things are. And then, of course, you have the recovery movement and, and you know, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, um, Narcotics Anonymous. You know, um, you, you have this famous phrase, w- which everybody should know by heart, which is that we are only as sick as our secrets. And and I really love that because it it's it's true about human nature in general. And it's certainly true um, uh, about how we understand our relationship to Christ as the one who loves us and who is our physician and who is healing us on a continual basis throughout our lifetimes, you know, not only through the other sacraments, Holy Communion, especially, but also with this gift of Holy Confession. So I, I'm glad you brought that up. We want to remind our listeners, give us a call at one eight five five af radio That's 1-855-237-2346, or send us a text to 412-206-5012. For those of you that have sent texts, I promise you we're going to get to your questions tonight. So, Father Paul, let's uh, talk a little bit, because you just talked about healing. Yes. So... Normally, we think of confession as the forgiveness of sins. Now, again, just from the idea of the cynic, right? The cynic will look at this and say, oh, well, you're just getting an easy out. You go to the priest and he waves his magic wand and you get forgiven of your sins. So you're speaking about healing. So, So talk about the relationship between healing and forgiveness and and how that works. And, and actually, if you could also kind of describe, do we somehow um, talk about the condition of the penitent? In other words, uh, it, 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 is it just enough for somebody to say it? and not feel actual sorrow for their sins and they're forgiven them or sort of what are the mechanics here? So let's talk about healing, forgiveness and and so forth. Yeah. Right. And the need to, to come forward to confession, you know, with, with good honesty and openness, but also with faith and love. But let me say this uh, specifically about that. You know, uh, we sometimes, um, uh, among us, uh, at Sa- among my community at St. Luke, we'd like to say going to confession is sometimes like the movie Groundhog Day. I don't know if it's an old movie, you know, um, <laughs> and, and it's about, you know, yeah, right. or, you know, this actor, Bill Murray, and, you know, the same day, the same things happen. And so we come to the Lord, and unfortunately, very often, of course, we're going to be confessing the same passions and the same sins. However, that does not mean that we we do it just you know as an obligation or that we don't bring to this confession a sense of sorrow and a sense of contrition and also you know a a resolve that we're going to fight the good fight and that with God's help and that with good counsel we are going to change and that we're going to grow forgiveness is deliverance in the first sense forgiveness means that we are no longer enslaved as St. Paul would say, to the, to, to, the, to the passion, to the carnal desires, um, to the sinful desires of the old human nature, of the old man, and that we are freed so that we can actually be ourselves. And, you know, we, we have this all over the place, in, you know, in the book of Psalms. You know, I love to preach about this one verse, 
you know, as far as the East is from the West, so far yes. does the Lord remove our transgressions mm-hmm. from us, which if you really think about it, is a miracle just as great as raising the dead. You know, if we think about it in terms of what our lives are like and how broken and sinful we truly are, but the Lord truly does that. But it is deliverance. It's freedom in, in that sense. But but that's not the only, that's just the first dimension. This The deeper dimension, the second part of it, is that we are engaged in a a life of healing you know i i i had a compacted tooth that broke and it was it was i had to go have one of those famous things we call a root canal you know and Mm -hmm. actually holy confession is a lot like going to your favorite dentist (laughs) you love your dentist i love my dentist dentist i'll I'll shout out to him dr pat (laughs) sava the greatest guy great but it's not a pleasant experience you know, right. and unless unless that rot gets cleaned out, you know, mm. then it's going to fester. And if we don't do it, of course, you know, uh, more terrible things, you know, are are going to you know more terrible things are, are going to happen. But the healing part of it is also very, um, I would say, very distinctive, and we understand this in terms of overcoming the passions. For example, we, we all have our own pride. And pride is self-love. We love ourselves in the sense that we live for ourselves. We think only about ourselves. Um, right. uh, it's putting ourselves first. You know, um, there's vainglory. There's anger. There's lethargy, laziness, despondency, despair, lust, gluttony, and greed. For example, these are the eight vices or passions that we would we would find expressed in the Holy Father, St. John the Latter, for example, um, you know, speaks about them, you know, in his book uh, on the, well, on, on the ladder, you know, the, the 30 steps. But we don't just confess, for example, our anger. You know, what the church does through this sacrament is that, yes, we are, we are forgiven our, our anger, you know, but also we turn that anger as a passion right side up. Because it's a desire. It's a sinful desire. But mm-hmm. desire itself, we believe in the church, is something that is blessed by God. And right, if, right. if it's a sinful desire, it's only because we're fallen, broken human beings. But through confession and through the grace of God and through repentance and through you know a literal lifelong slog of fighting against these kind of things, and you know, we can begin to turn that desire and and what is anger when we when we flip it up into a virtue it becomes zeal it becomes this holy mm. and righteous zeal uh, and and as with all of the other passions we just spoke about lethargy lethargy becomes becomes diligence despondency despair becomes hope you know lust becomes chastity or purity you know, gluttony becomes, you know, of course, moderation, and and greed becomes kind of two things. It becomes simplicity and poverty of spirit, but it also becomes Mm -hmm. generosity because, you know, we can give this stuff away because we're not, again, enslaved, you know, to thinking that, you know, the more we have somehow, you know, the happier and the more secure we're going to be, you know. So in other words, yeah. What what you're saying is to take these passions, and it's not simply a matter of don't do this, but it's a yeah. matter of take that passion and turn it into something that is uh, glorifying a God. A virtue. A virtue. You know, and mm-hmm. remember that, you know, and I really stress this with my faithful here at St. Luke— that to be a Christian doesn't just mean to follow Christ. Following Christ means to exemplify and embody all of his virtues. You know, he is the only good. You know, um, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. It, you know, it actually is, oh, give thanks to the Lord for the good one is he, um, which we've talked about before on this show. And so we adopt all of these beautiful virtues that are 
Christ life in us, but we have to fight the good fight for them. And we do this, of course, through faith and love. But yes, we do this through repentance, through through our our. But we do it most most particularly in this sacrament of the mystery of holy confession, because you know this is where we we open up and show ourselves to the Lord. Um, and we have so, to be vulnerable to him. We have to open up. You know, there's one passage in the gospel, again, from St. Matthew in the Sermon on the mm-hmm. Mount, the seventh chapter. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not do many mighty works in your name? And then he, the Lord, will declare to them, depart from me, for I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Now, that's an interesting passage, isn't it, Father Thomas? Because we believe that the Lord is omniscient. He knows all things. He knows everyone. But he needs to know us in the way that only we can show him uh, by loving him in return and by opening up ourselves and then being honest and, and telling him, how we are and what we have done. And I would even add to this, you know, we, we unlearn all of the running away and all of the hiding that is part of our Adam and Eve fallen nature. Because when the Lord comes to us looking for us, again, we run away from him and we hide. And, and confession means we stand before him, before that gospel and before that cross with the priests there, you know, literally as a representative of the entire church. And, and we face ourselves and, and we face what we've done in our lives. And, and we, we, um, we tell him everything um, so that we might find that forgiveness and continue to engage in that mystery of turning all of those those evil passions, those desires, like I say, right side up. And um, that's where we get into confession as something more than, you know, I I pulled the dog's tail or I cussed someone out because they <laughs> cut me off when I was driving home from right. work. Yeah. You know, we're, we're right. digging deep and we were able to say, well, maybe I know, I think I, I know I'm angry because I was hurt by somebody. And I was so deeply hurt that that um, I can only be angry about it. But maybe I need to look at that hurt. And maybe the priest needs to say, well, why do you think God allowed this to happen to you? And then, you know, you can move on and, and you know, find find your way through it. Um, okay. And hold, it, like hold, say, hold, yeah. hold, hold on here, Father Paul. So uh, let's remind our listeners, 1-855-AF-RADIO or send us a text to 412-206-5012. So, Father Paul, I want to ask you two real quick um, follow-up questions to what you just said, and then we're going to go for a break. So the first sure. one is uh, you were you were listing these passions like pride and vainglory, yeah. anger, lethargy, and so forth. Um, so Cindy writes in, and she says... I am so tired of confessing the same thing over and over again. How do I get out of this rut, out of this rut? Thank you. Love to you and Papadia. Good. And, and um, she is expressing, you know, a good frustration about how we are and how we struggle against our sins. Let me just say this for most of us, we're going to really, like I say, slog it out. And in many areas with these passions, we're, we're going to do better and better over a whole lifetime. There are going to be some things, and even the Holy Fathers write about this. For example, you know, the, the, the new or the modern Greek saint, St. Saint um, you know, he, he writes about this. And, um, um, you know, so, but there are going to be, there are going to be, some of these passions are going to really be stuck with us you know, for, for a very long time. And, and why this happens, you know, only God knows. Sometimes it has to do with things that happened to us in our childhood, uh, with, with uh, um, family life, with some, some, maybe some trauma issues. But I would say 
never forget what the Lord says. You know, the Lord says, you know, that he is merciful and forgiving 70 times seven, which, of course, you know, is, is just infinite. You know, when I talk to my teenagers, I, I say, well, we don't want to justify our sins ever, you know, which we might talk about here, too, which is a danger. But we want to remember that, you know, our God is a God of a thousand do-overs. And if he wasn't, we'd mm. all be dead. You know, right. we would all be dead right. if it wasn't for that continual mercy. And that we should come if we need to and confess over and over, you know, until the Lord sees fit in, in order to redeem us. Now, let me say this about that, that specific problem, which is probably very common to, to most of us. You know, I read a wonderful sermon by Archbishop Anthony Bloom, or it may have been just a little, a little article, a little essay about these kind of sticky sins and sticky passions. And he said there was a young man that came to him with this particular sin, a sin of the flesh, and he was very much grieved by it over a number of years. And, and finally, Archbishop Anthony Bloom said, you know, don't give up, don't despair. And then he said to him, when the Lord sees that you have come to hate this sin in the proper mm. degree, what he meant, when you have really come to hate and loathe this sin, then he will take it from you. And when I read that, I said, amen, that's me. Mm -hmm. Because very often we're still struggling with our sins because we may not want to let that passion go. We may want sure. to hold on to it for some crazy, stupid, foolish, you know, reason. Um, it's a hard thing to let the idols go. Um, and, um, and, and we all know that. But, you know, I would add to that, when the Lord sees that we loathe our sins, he will take these from us. And then he will give us something even more distressing. Because according to the fathers again, and especially the monastic saints, we will be tempted until our last breath. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it, will, it will be a life of, you know, well, you have that famous book, you know, by Saint, uh, uh, the, the Unseen Warfare. Um, and, and so where we are is, is confessing our sins um, and being honest and then hoping and praying and even begging God that he will give us this grace to overcome to change, to heal, and, and to continue, you know, um, along the, that, um, engage in that, in that mystery by where these passions are not just overcome, but they're transformed. And that, remember, Father Thomas is uniquely Orthodox. I think it's there in, in Roman Catholicism and to some extent in, in some of the other Protestant confessions. However, I would say that Orthodox, we have this sense of, of, transformation in, in a very right. rich way. And we see right. this, like I just said, in the writings, you know, maybe of the Desert Fathers, but they're all, it's all laid out for us as, as we witness the lives of the saints, which is why these saints are all given well, to us. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I want to ask you on the other yeah. side of this break about the, the sins themselves. In other words, I think there but, is a kind of caricature um, that comes from maybe other confessions. You know, we see it on TV. Bless me, Father, for I've sinned. It's been two weeks yeah. since my last yeah. confession. Yeah. And then, you know, I've done bup, 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 right? And right. Um, I, what I want you to do really on the other side of this break is kind of talk to us a little bit about the, the scope of of what we're actually supposed to be looking at and preparing, because I think that's part of the issue. In other words, yeah. people will only know what to say if they know where to look. And if right. they're saying, oh, yeah, well, I hit the dog and I got mad at my kids and yeah. I, you know, uh, flip somebody off in traffic or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. the, like, that's all they know 
instead of you're talking about something much deeper, which are these uh, passions that are controlling us. So what we're going to do, hold on, Father Paul, we're going to come right back. You are listening to Ancient Faith today. We are talking with Father Paul Janakis. We're talking about confession. This is really important. Come right back. We will be right back. Father Tom will be back in a moment. In the meantime, the lines are open at 855-237-2346. Don't go away. New from Ancient Faith Publishing. Secret Turning, a collection of short stories by Stephen Signori. So, I'm out in the lot of Little Heaven. And up comes Father Nahum from behind, grabs me, gives me a kiss, and tells me he's happy to see me. Wearing his worn-out dungaree bib overalls with the beat-up straw Stetson, pulling his wire basket, going shopping on the avenue. How old is Nahum, anyway? Sharky asked. Older than he acts, Lefty said. Two beer red, he said, yeah, and younger than he seems. So he says to me, Theodri, the church is much better when you're there. It's not the whole family when we don't see you. You know, God misses his children, and Nana Olga misses her son. Now available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook at store.ancientfaith.com. We're back with Ancient Faith Today and Father Tom Soroka. Give us a call at 855 237 2346. Here once again is Father Tom. Welcome back. We're talking about confession with Father Paul Janakis. Father Paul, I want to just follow up real quick about this because we've got a lot to talk about. So the scope of what we are supposed to be presenting in terms of confession. Um, Often, as you know, as a priest, uh, we will hear things like, um, "I, I got mad at my kids. I had a fight with my wife. Right. And you're mentioning things that are on a much different level. You're talking about pride and vainglory and anger and lethargy. How can people be more aware of things at those level, at that level? Or is it the responsibility of the priest to kind of direct them there? Because I think some people would be very, um, be a very offended by that, right? They might say, oh, well, yeah, you're prying. Yeah. And, it, you know, so so how yeah. in terms of getting to the heart of the matter, can can we do that better? Good. I, 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 would, I would answer your question, which is very good, important question, by saying both. People themselves are responsible for coming to an accurate knowledge of themselves, to know who they are, to know what they are, and to know how they behave and to understand, you know, where these, where these problem behaviors, uh, where these sinful passions are, are coming from. Uh, but also, it's certainly, we're priests, and that's part of our work. We're, that's part of our job description, isn't it, Father Thomas? When we yeah, preach yeah, yeah. the gospel, we preach the good news about the Lord risen from the dead who loves us like no one, other, uh, like no one else. But um, in order to know that love, we we have to we have to we have to be responsible. We have to come to do something about our our our, our sinfulness. You know, in the in the Bible, it's very interesting that whenever God shows Himself to the to the people who who open themselves to Him, it's always this ter- terrifying experience. You know, you would think that you know when the heaven is opened, that you know we would we want to you know scream out hallelujah. You know, but often, like with St. Peter and the multiplication of the fish, you know, just being in the Lord's presence and having that revelation of who he is is a revelation of how broken we are. But what we're talking about is scope and, and what we might also call frame of reference. Right, frame of reference. And the frame of reference is what we just said, the gospel. And we might even hone in on that and say that there are um, uh, three or four chapters, three chapters in in the Gospel of St. Matthew that we now call the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And everything in those chapters 
is all about um, not just bad behavior, right? I, I cussed out my next door neighbor because God knows he did did something. It's about that internal aspect of, of finding and seeing what is driving the behavior, and that's that's the passion, and that's what Jesus says. You know, um, you know, if you look at another woman. And, you know, you, you lust after her. You have already committed adultery where? In your heart, you know. Um, and, and so that's where the Lord is, is coming to this. But those seven or eight passions are there in the scriptures, you know, so clearly. And I also believe that they're there in the Ten, in the Ten Commandments, which is kind of the, you know, the place to, to begin. I, I think we need to look at our, our human nature and say, you know, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a good human being? And, you know, people have been trying to answer that question for thousands of years. For us, it's all about Christ. And and so those virtues that we see exemplified in Christ are these seven or eight things, humility, love, forgiveness, patience, you know, all, and, and we hold on to them, and we take them to ourselves as a gift by grace because these are, these are the things that, that make us most human. But that frame of reference is very important because if we don't have those seven passions that we're looking out for, then we're going to be looking at otherworldly uh, ideas about what morality is. Um, can and perhaps should be, and that could set us up for some some you know problems as, as we as we go down the road. But it's all about okay. Christism. Yeah, yeah, very good. So uh, just for our listeners, if you're on Facebook, I'm just listing those um, on Facebook right now in that thread uh, because I think it's sort of like a good point of reference. And I guess my point in in saying that is. You gave very good advice in terms of look to the Gospels, look at the Sermon on the Mount, look at the life of Christ and so forth. I, I'm just wondering, do you have, if you don't, it's fine. Do you have a specific um, uh, book or material that you could recommend that is a good preparation for confession that goes over these uh, passions? Yeah, you know— um, I do. And there is a wonderful, um, I don't know what they call it. We call it a common confession, I think, by St. John Kronstadt. And many of the churches uh, of our OCA churches will use this as preparation for our people, you know, before uh, holy confession, because it, it really helps us, especially to get to what we call the nitty gritty of this stuff. And and to give us the, the right words that, that we can kind of, you know, we can hold on to and say, yeah, that's me, and that that's that's uh, that's pretty much, you know, where I'm at, and these are the things that, that I've done. But uh, so after starting with the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which has to be foundational to, to all of this, and, and remember that, you know, again, I remember being, being taught when I was studying, you know, at, at seminary, that orthodoxy, we really don't have, you know, ethical theology. You know, that's kind of a, a that's kind of a creation of Western theology, a category of theology whereby we explore ethics or morality. We would say that this is Christology, and it's an expression of our understanding of who Christ is. It's all Christological, you know. Correct. So, so. That's where we start. And then also, besides Saint, this little meditation, it's one page long uh, by, by St. John of Kronstadt. Um, there are other, you know, um, little helps, preparations uh, written by, you know, various saints, you know, that, that, might be, that might be helpful. And I could list a few of those. But the other place that I would, you know, I would really go to is kind of the back to the lives of the saints. You know, the lives of the saints are about holiness, but how they gain this holiness through their repentance. And so, you know, for example, you know, when I was younger, I struggled 
quite a bit with the passion of despondency and even depression. That was a that was a major thing for me when I was in my late twenties and early thirties, and I really really struggled w- with that for for a number of years. Um, and God blessed me with it. Actually, I had to. I learned that there's a difference between the passion of despondency, and then, of course, something that we would we might call clinical depression. But that's for another time. We've talked about that before. I think, haven't we, Father Thomas? But yeah, sure. You know, going to the lives of the saints and seeing that they too face that despondency, that same sense right. of hopelessness, and and how they were able to, you know overcome it, work through it. And that's where the really rich material comes for, you know, the the kind of my my own confession. Um, yeah. And that seems yeah. to be very common today to, you know, people really struggle with despondency. But Father Paul, because we're the the clock is ticking, yeah, I want to yeah. get to some of these uh texts uh questions yeah. here. So here's one. This is sort of right up your alley. And it says how do we separate, this is from Eleni, how do we separate confession from spiritual counseling, if at all? Why do we yes. confess twice? Thank you, Eleni. You know, here's the thing. Confession is confession, and counseling is counseling. And I do think we have to be careful that we don't turn our confessions themselves into counseling sessions. Um And I think as priests, we have to be very careful about that. We may want to um, continue a a conversation or a discussion about something uh, apart from the actual sacrament itself. But the counsel that the priest gives to the, 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 the person who's confessing, in my estimation, should be very simple, direct. It should be precise. And in my view, it should come from the gospel and nothing else. You know, the priests don't need to be giving whatever, you know, crazy opinion that they have uh, about, you know, some, you know, third century Egyptian, you know, saint um, and what they may have done. You know, no, we can speak about, you know, what Jesus says again in this sermon on the <laughs> Sermon on the Mount with some practical you know, with some practical offerings, you know, I'll always say, what is your prayer life like? That's, you know, how people know. I, I start with that question. I don't, I don't mm. uh, do any kind of questions. I, I let people confess themselves. They have to work that. And then from, you know, that question, we're able to find some practical answers about, you know, how to, how to, um, how to do things better you know, how to con- continue okay. in, in that struggle. Right. Okay. Um, here's another que- que- question. This is actually kind of interesting. So uh, this is an anonymous question. It says, do I have to wait to become an Orthodox Christian to go to a priest to confess my sins? Do I have to go and finish catechism before I can confess? Well, so this I, person I is not orthodox. Be, Maybe they're a catechumen, correct. and they want to know when can they sure. do this. Uh, I think that they might. Uh, that should impel them to continue in their preparation. You know, to become orthodox, either by being if they're not baptized, or, or you know, to be baptized or or to be chrismated. You know, I I really think that uh, you you can't we can't offer the sacraments formally in this sense to those people who who have not been received into the life of the church through to holy baptism and chrismation. And I would, have, of course, add, you know, that, that we're regularly receiving Holy Communion. But they can have spiritual counsel with their, with their priest about these kind of passions. And it can be actually a form of confession, even though it's, it's, it's more it's indirect and it's, it's not going to be categorized or understood as being you know, um, one of the, the sacraments. Um, but, but I, you know, I do actually with, with my faithful, you know, we do quite a bit of that. As I mentioned before, things come up in, in confession. Let's go, let's go talk about it right back and we'll talk about it and and, and we'll have a cup of tea and, you know, we'll we'll talk about where, where you are with your life and 
What what are the things yeah. that are framing all of this? You know, I want to know, you know, well, um, what's going on with you at work? How's your health? Well, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, in yeah, other words, yeah. the the question the question gets turned around because you know the question is is counseling confession, and you said no, it's not. No, but also confession is not counseling. <laughs> And I Correct. think a lot of our people are are sort of confused about that. In other words, um, confession is confession, counseling is counseling. There may yep. be some overlap, but there is one and there is the other, and we have to remember that. Father, I, I do want to kind of keep moving here. Good. Um, Good. So here's here's another question that came in, and it says... At what age should our children begin to go to confession? How can I help them prepare in an age-appropriate way? My children are six and seven years old. Also, how much detail should I give when I'm confessing my sins? I don't want to give too many unnecessary details, but I don't know if I'm being too vague or too general. This is Anastasia from Dallas. So two questions there. What? How do we prepare our kids and what, what's the right age and how much detail yeah. do we go into in our own confessions? Well, wonderful. Let me start with the second question, which is often um, brought up by other people. Um, I was actually speaking about that same issue with um, some of my family today. So we, we don't want to be so general that we, can, we don't confess anything because we can go to the doctor, you know, with, with, a, with a, a, a broken you know, a broken ankle and say, you know, my body hurts. Um, there's so something on my body hurts. Well, if the doctor doesn't know where we're hurting, we don't tell him specifically what this is. W there's not going to be any, any way that we can be treated. You know, that it just goes, goes without saying. On the other hand, um, and this is what I was taught and what I advise is that, you know, those who are confessing do not need to be graphic. Um, we don't need to be graphic in terms of how many times um, we just want to speak about patterns and we want to speak about it in kind of plain and simple terms, you know, um, like, for example, we we're talking about anger. If somebody has a, you know, we call it an anger management problem and they have, they have this, this, this continual kind of sin of, of, you know, uh, blowing their top or, or screaming and yelling, you know, they don't need to get into the exact time and place. And here's what he said. And here's what I said. You know, uh, we don't need to be so detailed that we lose, you know, the forest for the trees. We want to say, here's a pattern. And you know, we want to provide enough, you know, um, kind of um, simple explanation that we're actually, you know, confessing. So that that's very good. So not too general and not too graphic, but simple Good. and plain, you know. And then Great. again, let me say this, without diminution, without diminishing what the sin actually is, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a something that is, is an obstacle, w without blaming other people for, for mm, what's happening. Right, 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 and, right. And without ever justifying ourselves, you know, um, you know, you know, you know, we, we, um, we, we we are always tempted to kind of come in. Uh, so that's the first thing. Now, for children, uh, you know, it's so good to, to know this. Every child is going to be different, but I would say six, seven, or eight, you know, at the latest. And our children, as they reach this stage, are going to de develop what we would call critical insight. And it's the same age almost, you know, when when my grandson comes to me and said, if God created the world and the universe who created god so sure, right. this is a deeply theological question he doesn't know it but he's already touched upon <laughs> the, the the you know the 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 super essence of god you know from say Dionysius the areopagite almost but you know they're able to think critically meaning they're able to start seeing themselves and their behaviors and to know that um these these kind of feelings and behaviors are are um, are 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 a problem, and and I would say that parents should be very careful in the way that they they help the children develop a keen 
um, what we would call a, a keen and healthy conscience. So that's something that's very human and, and very natural. And you know, to have a to have a, the conscience of a child is is to be pure of heart. So they will know themselves, you know, when they when they do these things wrong, when they make these these mistakes, and the parents can't help them. And the parents, in the way that they prepare the, their children for confession, can actually kind of what we call script it out. You know, um, remember that preparation for holy confession is in the Bible. When the prodigal son uh, decided to go back to his father, he actually said, I will go to my father and I will say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I mean, he literally scripted that out before he he, he came to his father. So, you know, we can yeah, help sure. our children along, you know, in, but the development of that conscious consciousness with good faith and love in our children, you know, to discipline them in a, in a very loving, gentle, sometimes we have to be firm with them, but to help that right. conscience come alive, you know, I I had, uh, um, I I well, I'll tell I'll tell you the story later. But some okay. of my well, some of my most moving confessions are with children because it's so simple and it's so they're so um, open and and it's it puts it puts us to shame as adults, you know that, that I wish I can confess. Like an eight-year-old. As honestly as them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I have two more questions that came in, so we have to get to these. Um, The first one is a a kind of confession, and, and she's asking for advice. It's Gabrielle. She says, Father Paul, you said that God takes away your passion if you really hate it. I'm an iconographer, and I really hate drinking alcohol. I have noticed that I have a passion for wine and have been praying for it, to, uh, praying for it to not drink it. How would you approach this? Thank you. Good. So good. It's a good pastoral uh, question, and of course, uh, that belongs to our our life of repentance. Remember, there are going to be people who are are more predisposed to some of these um, sin, sins and passions, and um, you know, having worked you know, in the area of, of alcoholism and addictions for many years, having, uh, I mean, my family, I think every family, at least in an extended way, has, has, has somebody who struggles with the disease of, of chemical dependency or some kind of addiction. But I would, I would say that continue to confess, never lose hope, but also that at some point they may want to um, uh, go outside uh, of the, of the, confession or the church and seek help, you know, from either Alcoholics Anonymous with a sponsor, um, start to do some good reading about, you know, healing from, um, uh, healing from, uh, you know, um, uh, this kind of dependency. Because at a certain point with this, with this passion, with this sin, the disease, but it's also neurobiological. And, and we're dealing with a dependency, which means that the body itself mm. has become um, addicted in the sense that there's tolerance and withdrawal. And so, you know, we may need to go to a physician and have some physician assistance there and to do that carefully, you know, because people maybe who have been drinking for a number of years every day, if they go cold right. turkey off of that alcohol, you know, they could actually seize uh, and, and um, have a stroke. So there are ways to basically detox, and then also to find um, find a good uh, find a, uh, you know c- continue to live in the life of the church and, and and everything that we do as Orthodox Christians, but also to uh, use and embrace the resources that are available, you know in in the um, in the recovery community. And uh, okay, I, I yeah. Very good. All right. So uh, one more question that came in, and then I'm going to ask you one last question, and we're already out of time. It just flies by. So Shannon Shannon from Orlando asks about uh, kind of an unusual question here. Does confession 
play a role within the marriage? In other words, should married people confess to one another and have accountability to one another? Sure, they can. And you know, every marriage is different. Let me say this. You know, Michelle and I, my wife, we like to kind of, well, we kind of say, you know, when we go to confession, we ask each other, um, uh, what should I confess? You know, we do it. <laughs> You know, our, our spouses know, know us better than we know ourselves. That's cute. They're actually yeah. able to see. They see our blind spots. And I could really go into that, you know, with, with myself and, and thank God marriage as a two-way street. We're able to share with each other in love and patience and forgiveness, you know, what our, what our faults are. And even those faults that are continual. And so we do confess that and we ask for forgiveness you know, from each other on one of our other shows. Remember, I, I said that the three phrases that, that are so integral to a good marriage every day, I love you, thank you, I'm sorry, or forgive me. You know, those, those three things. Now, I think what mm-hmm. Shannon is saying that maybe couples can confess to each other their sins as part of the way that they're making their confession in, in church. And I would say that that, that, that can happen. But I would say also that not every marriage is going to be able uh, to handle that. Um, there are some things um, that a, a, a spouse may want to bring to the priest in confession and confess, um, you know, without uh, her husband or his wife necessarily having to know it, especially if that husband or wife is the source of their grief and suffering. You see what I'm yeah, saying? Right. Um, sure. uh, you know, that would because, be aggravating. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, because marriage is suffering, no matter what we, we, we you know, and, and we do afflict each other in so many ways. And, and so we have to go and confess, you know, how, how we may torture our spouses in, 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 in thousands of different ways throughout a whole lifetime, you know, um, and, and um, you know, that I was a real jerk to my wife or whatever, you know, because of all, all of the things that, that have happened. We need to ask for forgiveness from that. But sometimes I do think that there, there's the need uh, for uh, disclosure uh, only to a trusted person for the health of, of that marriage. And so right, every right. marriage, every relationship is different. But I know, uh, add to, added to this, when I was a priest in Minneapolis, in, in, in um, gosh, that was uh, 35 years ago, I had several uh, married. They confessed as a couple. They came to confession together wow. and confessed. Wow, you know, which was unique. You know, it's amazing. But, um, they that and and I'm 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 confess. I'm I'm pretty sure they and and uh, it was very it was very beautiful thing. Um, but again, that's probably more of an exception. Um, sure. You know, okay. Because let there me, are things that let me, need, yeah, go ahead. It's, it's a really good point. Yeah. Let me ask you one last question and then we have to wrap it up. So there's one issue here that we don't hear a lot about in orthodoxy, at least that I'm aware of. I know that it exists, but we don't hear about it too much. Uh, And that is penances. Um, Are penances regularly given? Should they be regularly given? Again, I'm going to go to the kind of um, caricature, right, on TV. Okay, well, say three Hail Marys and ten Our Fathers, right? Uh, That's the caricature, right? Yeah. Um, Yeah, What is. is a penance? What is a penance? What is it for? What does it kind of look like? Give us an so, example. It's different than what you would find there in the in the Roman tradition, I think, especially maybe the the, the later the later you know uh, Roman you know centuries, because we don't just say say five our fathers and three Hail Marys and everything is going to be peachy, you know, and and the first thing to say what a penance is is to say what it's not, and and this is to say that it's not punitive. You know that you have to you have to suffer these things 
uh, by this negative discipline in order to somehow uh, be forgiven, which is which is just madness. I mean, it's not even gospel, you know. Right. So so what a penance is is something therapeutic, and we would call it maybe in our modern parlance, you know, we call it in therapy sometimes an intervention. Um, and that if someone, for example, has committed a more grievous sin, they may be given a penance by their spiritual father in order to help them understand the gravity of, of such a, a sin and then to help them really work their way through it. I do think that um, we, we don't probably um, give out penances as much as we could or maybe should. It depends on, right. on the faith. You know, um, per, uh, someone that comes in confession with, with, a very, with a very shaky faith, it, it could be actually dangerous to do that. Um, uh, I do think, though, that there, there are things that need to be, you know, given as part of this kind of penitential therapy. You know, um, and that's certainly part of the monastic tradition, you know, with with the monastic elders and, and how they how they give penances. But it's always something therapeutic in order to help us, you know, in order to help us heal. Can, so can you yeah. give me an example? Can, can you sure. give a like, you know, if somebody comes and, and says they um, I don't know, I mean, give give, give an example of what would be a, a kind of an orthodox penance outside of prayers and so forth? And let me say outside of the monastic tradition, too, because you and I are married right. priests. And I right. do think that, that it's safer for married people and families to go to um, a married priest who, who's a good confessor than to go to a monastic elders, even though, you know, that's also part and parcel to our, our tradition, so I would say that's also acceptable, even though, you know, I'm not sure it should be the norm. But, um, you know, I, I do feel, for example, let's say somebody uh, commits adultery um, and they come and they confess. Well, this is the sin that is, you know, uh, of a particular, in a particular category, which is somewhat, you know, it's, it's a grievous thing. And the priest may choose to, um, you know, withdraw Holy Communion for a period of time, maybe a month or maybe three months. Um, and then he will give, uh, the priest will give uh, the, the one who has confessed a, a, a penance where they have to read uh, all 150 psalms uh, before they come back, you know, mm -hmm. uh, at that point to Holy Confession. Um, you know, and, and that will happen. It happens, I think, in America. You know, the, these kind of penances are not given so so routinely as, as they used to be. Um, and I don't do it myself that often. Um, right. One of the things that I do as a priest when I do give a penance is I always I will perform the penance with the people that I give a penance. So if I tell wow. them to read through the Gospel of St. John, then that becomes, I don't tell them, but that becomes my, my scriptural read for the next, you know, four weeks, <laughs> because wow. I want it to be an act of the church. And if they don't do it, if they're not able to complete it, then I can complete that, you know, penance for them. So, mm, and it also, you. and it also keeps me from giving a penance that is, 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 <laughs> Do I want to put myself in a situation, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? You know that that is going to be, uh, you know, um, particularly you know di sure. difficult, you know. Um, okay, well, you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, that's that was that's a, that's uh, fascinating. I yeah. I've never yeah. heard a priest say that before. So that you know yeah. you would fulfill it too. God bless you for that, Father Paul. Yeah. We uh, we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion about um, confession, the sacrament of confession, and why it's so important, giving us this insight into how to yeah. make a better confession. And it's been very, very helpful. Thank you very, very thank much. Thank you, Father Tom, for all your good work and, and for such a, a wonderful ministry that you've had here at Ancient Faith Radio. And uh, thank you, Matushka Trudy, 
for um, uh, being such a, a wonderful and faithful um, producer. Hello. Yep, sorry, didn't have my button on there. Uh, thank That's you, right. Father Paul. Thank you, Father Trudy. That was, that was keeps a great us, show. Keeps us in line. Thank you so much. All right, Thanks so uh, before I share a few final thoughts, I want to offer my sincere thanks to Father Paul Janakis for joining us tonight. Thanks also to Matushka Trudy, as Father Paul said, for engineering the program tonight. To our show production assistant, Melissa Graff, for her work behind the scenes, for everybody that listened in, and for those who brought in their uh, questions and comments. Uh, just a quick line from uh, St. John's first epistle. He says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And that's our show for tonight. Remember to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Ancient Faith Today. Share out our program after that's posted. Give us your feedback and contact us with any ideas or topics that you might want to hear about. Join us next Tuesday evening for another edition of Ancient Faith Today. Good night, everybody.